right, we're going to go ahead and get started here. I am Caitlin Rubley. I am the Climate Change and Health Interest Group Chair uh, for the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine and hosting this with Dr. Tracy Cushing from the University of Colorado. This is our first climate and health webinar series and this is our very first lecture. Um, it, it sparked out of an interest from residents and medical students and fellows and faculty uh, coming to us and being like, how can we get involved? I think I'm the only one at our, my institution working on climate and health. How can I learn more about nutrition and sustainable healthcare and uh, education and policy? Uh, and so uh, out of that came a discussion and a partnership uh, with our interest groups and to offer expert, uh, expert advice uh, to talk to you about their interests and be an open forum for questions uh, to spark your own ideas and research projects. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Tracy Cushing to introduce our speaker here this evening. Feel free to use the chat, uh, post questions throughout, uh, raise your hand, uh, message any of us, and we'll either stop um, or take questions at the end as well. So welcome everybody and I'll turn it over to Dr. Cushing. Thanks, Caitlin, and welcome everybody. It's nice to see or meet you all. Uh, I'm Tracy, I work at the University of Colorado um, in the ER, and I'm the chair of the Wilderness Medicine Interest Group, which um, Caitlin and I thought had a lot of overlap between climate and wilderness, and so hopefully some of you are here from that group as well. And I'm thrilled to be introducing Dr. Alan Kornberg, our first speaker of the series. Um, Dr. Kornberg served as vice chair and associate professor of pediatrics and associate professor of emergency medicine at the University of Buffalo, as well as associate professor of pediatrics at Brown. He has served as medical director with managed care organizations, provider institutions, as well as government and advocacy groups, typically working with complicated populations, both clinically and socioeconomically. Dr. Kornberg received his Bachelor in Science in Biology from MIT, his MD at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, and his MBA from the University of Rochester. Currently, he is the Medical Director of Physicians Association for Nutrition USA, and he and I met over a common goal of spreading the word of how diet can impact health and climate, and uh, I'm thrilled that he's our first speaker in the series today. Tracy and, and, and uh, Caitlin, thank you both for um, giving me the opportunity to speak to the um, to speak to Society for Academic Emergency Medicine. It's a real pleasure for me, and particularly today, to speak to both the climate and health and the wildlife sections. Um, and thanks to the staff of SAEM for um, managing all of the process around this talk and making everything possible. Um, so I think, uh, Tracy, as, as, as I think you, as I, I know that you know, um, while it's been a long time, I uh, was a member of SAEM a million years ago. Well, I think I was a member in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, uh, while a pediatrician, I'm, I've been a pediatric emergency physician and enjoyed attending SAEM meetings, back when we went to meetings in person. Um, enjoyed being at meetings in person and uh, having, a, uh, again, a long time ago, some opportunity to present abstracts and so on. So, so thank you both, uh, Caitlin and, and Tracy, and thank you to the staff, and let's get going. So I am uh, presenting this work from the Physicians Association for Nutrition, and we're calling this talk, The Power of Nutrition. Just thought that I would give you my contact information first. And so I am a medical director for the United States for uh, Physicians Association for Nutrition. And you can see our website information there, both our international organization and the U.S. branch. My email address, if anybody wants to reach out, and my phone numbers as well. And uh, anyone should feel free to reach out to me at any point in time. So today we'll talk about the following. We'll start as overview and to really anchor ourselves to this presentation. We'll start by talking about lifestyle medicine and blue zones, since this is the climate as well as the uh, wildlife sections of SAEM. And I know later in the academic year, you will be getting more in depth on climate and health and diet. Um, I will give some overview at least in the subject and then spend most of my time on what I'm calling power of nutrition, which is the, is the, the, the benefit of a, a, a whole food plant-based nutrition for uh, health and wellness and also in the prevention and treatment of disease. I'll say a few words about clinical practice. And since I am here on behalf of the Physicians Association for Nutrition, I'll give a, a brief PSA 
just kidding, uh, for, uh, for Pam at the uh, end of my talk as well. So without further ado, um, that's the, uh, the five sections of today's talk, and I will dive in with you now. Thank you again for having me. So I thought I would start with lifestyle medicine. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, I make reference to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and their website, really a, a wonderful professional organization, which now is offering boards. And uh, so anybody who wants to dive in more deeply, I would encourage you to go to lifestylemedicine.org. And at the high level overview of lifestyle medicine would be these seven key attributes that make sense for us individually, for our families, and of course, for our, our patients, the focus of today's talk. Having a purpose in life, um, I think some focus, some place we put our psychic, emotional, and physical energy in significant part is, is important. Having a sense of community, it could be professional, it could be family, it could be friends, all of the above. Stress management is, is really, really important. And I, uh, sorry about the uh, little happy face emoji there, but both the stress management and good sleep as, as I talk with emergency physicians, and, and we're talking mostly about your patients, uh, but also about ourselves. And I, having, having done the work, and uh, again, a, a long time ago, having done many, many uh, nights and, um, and change in shifts, it's, um, and, and knowing the culture of emergency medicine practice, stress management and good sleep um, can be hard to come by, but important for us as well. And so at least I will identify that. I, I would mention for myself personally, um, aside from as I've, I've grown and, and learned more about stress management, I, I've found uh, um, meditation to be a particularly good tool for myself and for many others as well. And, and when I have time in the morning, I'll do a 20-minute a meditation. And sometimes when I'm, uh, as we say here in Boston, where, I, where I'm based, when, we're, uh, when I'm wicked stressed out, um, I'll do a two or three-minute uh, mini meditation, and that will help to anchor me. Uh, and that may be a useful tool for our patients as well. Again, I know I'm talking to, to ER docs. Um, so stress management, good sleep, um, really, really important for all of us. Um, low alcohol consumption, we all know that. The, um, there was a, one, one of the, um, the high-end advisory groups just in the last couple of weeks came out with an advisory saying that for men as well as for women, um, we're now encouraged to have no more than one, one drink a day. The um, um, uh, the advice in the past has been men can have up to two drinks a day and women one. There's a trade-off, you probably all know this, but there's some, some cardiovascular benefits to alcohol. Alcohol is also a carcinogenic form evidence of that. And so in any event, keeping our alcohol consumption low is a good thing. Exercise, 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 and some exercise that brings the heart rate up pretty high uh, for 20 minutes a few times a week is a good thing. And then the focus of, of my talk, my presentation today, so I highlighted it, it's healthy diet, predominantly whole food, plant-based. And that's what we're here to talk about in significant part today. So let's talk about blue zones next. Blue zones are areas of the world where there's much greater longevity and less age-adjusted uh, morbidity. And, and five uh, have been identified, and there are a few others, five that are, that are well-known. One's in the, in the States, Loma Linda, and I'll say some more about that in just a little while, and, and that's uh, primarily a Seventh-day Adventist population. Costa Rica has a community, um, a couple in the Mediterranean, uh, Southern Italy, Sardinia, but also Greece, and Okinawa um, in Japan. And uh, uh, the pictorials um, you know, maybe are, um, do to some extent speak to um, um, a culture and a lifestyle that, um, at least for some people, not all brings people back to earth. So what are blue zones? Um, there's a, a higher longevity than for the rest of us uh, in a similar culture and age-adjusted population. So, th so that uh, uh, the average person in a blue zone community uh, lives at least 10 years longer than um, folks of the same um, nation or community at just some moderate distance from the, the, the Blue Zone community. Many more centen centenarians, sorry, um, and, um, and middle-aged folks, late 40s, 50s, 60s, um, uh, lower um, more, um, age-adjusted mortality, and interestingly and not surprisingly, uh, given the many theories about Alzheimer's and other dementias, there are, there are lower, um, considerably lower age-adjusted rates of dementia as well. What's important and, uh, and worth noting are that the, 
in the blue zones around the world, while geographically separate and also separate from nearby sort of regular communities, um, strikingly similar in terms of lifestyle behaviors with particular reference to diet, whole food plant-based diets. This is a description of the traditional diet in Okinawa, starting back in the 1950s and probably goes back hundreds if not thousands of years. Um, a, a pyramid that in some ways is inverted compared to what most Americans and, and most other quote unquote Western, Westerners eat. Very, very high in vegetables and fruits, um, high in legumes, uh, uh, peas, beans, and lentils, um, low glycemic grains, just a little bit of fish and uh, lean meats, a little bit of oils, healthy oils, um, um, like olive oil, and uh, very, very, very low on the sweets and, uh, um, and other um, processed carbs. What's interesting about Okinawa um, is that over the last few decades, the last generation or so, as it's been a greater Western influence on Japan. Um, some of that is an increase in per capita income. Most of that is simply a, a greater Western, um, uh, Western Europe, American, um, North American kind of diet. The traditional diet in Okinawa has, has deteriorated to some extent. While there still are blue zone populations, not everybody in Okinawa eats this diet that was uh, prevalent in the 50s. But the folks in the blue zone communities do. So Loma Linda uh, in California and the Seventh-day Adventist communities, um, it's a very large population study. Like these studies in general, one can't do a randomized controlled trial. The associations though can be striking. Uh, it's called the Adventist Health Study, 97 some odd thousand people. Um, Seventh-day Adventists have a, a faith-based um, diet and other behaviors, which, which, which uh, uh, at least according to faith, proscribes, uh, prohibits um, alcohol and tobacco, and also um, um, proscribes consumption of meat is a, a vegetarian diet. And so there were, as I said, nearly 100,000 people in the study, all from the Loma Linda community, the great majority Seventh-day Adventist, and um, some are vegan, uh, some um, ovo-lacto-vegetarian, and then around half, uh, more or less, um, eat meat as well, who served as the control for this study. So, so no matter the cholesterol levels, um, of diabetes status, blood pressure levels, um, and so on, um, when one does this um, case control study uh, or, or follow this population, uh, regardless of baseline cholesterol level, diabetes status, blood pressure, and so on, uh, vegetarians have lower health risk, lower morbidity and, and mortality than non-vegetarians in this population. It's really striking since the, since the, the key um, diet associated factors were controlled for. The data also shows a progressive weight increase from total veg, uh, vegetarian diet, vegan diet, or full plant-based diet um, to over lacto veg to non-vegetarian. So for example, um, when one looks at, at middle-aged, 55-year-old women and men um, who are entirely vegan in this population, um, they weigh about 30 pounds less than non-vegetarians of the same height, which is striking difference, striking on a population basis. Levels of cholesterol, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and metabolic syndrome um, will demonstrate the same trend. The closer one is on this population basis to being a vegetarian, uh, the lower the health risks uh, in all areas. And with respect to type two, uh, prevalence for um, fully plant-based people, vegans and uh, um, ovo-lacto um, vegetarians was half that of non-vegetarians. Again, a striking difference. This is even after controlling for all the factors that uh, the researchers could, including um, other lifestyle factors and socioeconomic factors. Um, the usual caveat for these kinds of population studies Although the results don't prove causation, I would say in, with this large study over a number of years and fairly recent, the early part of the century, um, the, 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 the causality suggestion, at least for me, and I think for many others, is pretty substantive here. So a population, again, that's in our, our own country, in the States. Um, well, let's spend a little bit of time talking about climate and diet. I won't spend a huge amount of time here because I, I know that you will have some other speakers later this year speaking to, um, um, to climate, but I'll make a few points about climate and diet specifically. Some of you may have seen slides like this before. This comes from a very um, 
well-anchored non-activist um, NGO, the Center for Sustainable Systems at the University of Michigan, go blue. Um, and you can see the, um, so the, um, the, the y-axis is uh, CO2 per serving, uh, per average serving, um, um, and the bars along the X are different food products. And so the, the, uh, the 6.61, the, the highest bar to the left, the gray bar is beef. I don't have, um, uh, sheep on the slide, but they would be next, or, or e eating sheep would be between um, um, beef and uh, and cheese, about four or so um, pounds CO2 per serving. Um, then cheese, then pork, then poultry, then eggs, then milk, and then you can see it's almost asymptotic with the, with the x-axis. Rice, legumes, carrots, potatoes, um, dramatic, dramatic difference, reduction in, in CO2 um, in the atmosphere compared to um, um, animal, um, eating meat and animal products. It's, it's really striking. Even for those uh, veg products that are known to have a fairly high um, uh, impact on, uh, on CO2, uh, say almonds, um, uh, because of the, the huge amount of water that's, that's used, uh, especially in California, to produce almonds, the, the, um, the amount of CO2 from almonds way, way less than animal products. It's, it's a striking, striking difference. If, if one were to do, um, in my view, and not just my view, you know, one thing um, to, um, to improve our individual and, and people in our orbits impact on, uh, um, on, on climate change, um, it would be um, to dramatically decrease um, animal, animal product consumption. So food and climate change, there's, there's again, you've probably seen or may have seen some other um, charts of this sort, production, animal agriculture has a number of impacts on CO2 production. There's the actual production of um, the, the raising and slaughtering of the animals themselves. There's the huge um, change in, in, in land use. There's deforestation, which is huge, the, the, you know, across the, the globe and in our country. And uh, we talk about this a lot in the Amazon rainforest, really across the world, the amount of deforestation um, for um, um, of sowing corn to feed um, feed animals so we can eat the animals is a, a dramatic impact on uh, on, on climate um, and then there's all the transport um, associated with um, um, animal agriculture um, I have seen um, from credible sources and because this is more it's not art but it's kind of <laughs> some art some science kind of like medicine um, the the percentage of impact of animal ag on um, total human production of CO2 in the atmosphere. I've seen numbers as low as 18% net net and as high as 51. Uh, 51 comes from a UN body. So someplace between 18 and 51%, um, it's huge. And uh, again, uh, you know, we, we all individually, are, uh, um, our friends and family, our colleagues, our patients, the one thing that we have direct impact on every day is not getting on a plane, we have something to do with what car we drive and so on, but it's what we put in our mouth three times a day or, or more. There's a huge, huge impact on climate. All right, I feel like I'm uh, proselytizing, so I'm gonna stop. But the, the numbers speak for themselves. This is Caitlin. I'm just gonna jump in for a second mm -hmm. um, and encourage our participants to think about how this relates to uh, the hospitals and the healthcare systems in which we work, right? So think about all the food needed in our cafeterias and for our patients and how much food waste there is uh, in addition, how much it takes in order to transport food in, to our healthcare facilities to provide it. So processing, transport, packing, and retail up to 20% for food and climate change. What does that mean when it is local versus transported, transported from states away? So try and apply it to some of the things you see within your own institutions, um, academic or, or whatnot and how you can create some changes and ask the right questions in your own communities. Well, before we get to individual health, we're all doctors who take care of patients one at a time. I wanted to talk a little bit more. So leaving climate, talk a little bit more about non-individual health um, aspects of animal agriculture. Um, key, key, it's antimicrobial resistance. Um, over 70% of all antibiotics um, use the United States um, and similar numbers um, in other parts of the world, although it's higher in the US, we're especially aggressive about this compared to other Western countries, uh, are given to animals raised for food, raised for human consumption. Um, 
and uh, just under 30 percent are, are used uh, for, for um, human treatment of disease and as a prophylaxis and also for uh, in veterinary medicine uh, where, where the antibiotic is prescribed as in people uh, for an individual animal to benefit the animal versus the huge amount of antibiotics that are given to animals raised for food in the horrific conditions of, of factory farming um, to, to allow the animals in these horrible environments um, where they suffer and disease spreads um, to, uh, to grow as fast as possible by, by throwing lots of antibiotics at them. And so then, of course, that raises the risk of antibiotic resistance. Um, well, and, and uh, given, uh, given the last six months, it would be remarkable if I didn't at least make note of pandemics. And I'm not here to give a talk on animal ag and pandemics. But suffice it to say that um, the great majority of pandemics um, in the modern era including COVID-19, of course, and, uh, and other pandemics, uh, most of the flus and so on. And in and, and earlier times as well, uh, come from our interaction with animals. They're, they're mostly zoonotic disease. And in the modern time, there's factory farming and wet markets and, and deforestation goes back a long ways. It brings wildlife closer to us and raises the um, uh, encounters uh, in an exponential way for um, human to animal contact and hence zoonotic disease. Uh, Michael Greger, who's a, a colleague, uh, very well known in the area of um, good health, nutrition, and uh, whole food plant-based diets. He's, he's also uh, fortunately a, a member of our board at Physicians Association for Nutrition and is the founder and leader of Nutrition Facts, which is a great, great charity. I think the world of Michael and I'm glad to have him um, help us in our work here at Penn. So one of his quotes, quote unquote, if you actually want to create global pandemics, then build factory farms, straight and to the point. And he uh, uh, just uh, put out, uh, you know, he, he has a couple of books, How Not to Die, uh, about whole food plant-based nutrition, How Not to Diet, uh, and has a new book on pandemics and animal agriculture being causative. All right, let's talk about power of nutrition, individual human health, our role as doctors. So a couple of quotes from the World Health Organization. If the major risk factors for NCDs, non-communicable disease, were all eliminated, um, uh, around three quarters of heart disease, stroke, and type two would be prevented, and 40% of cancer would be prevented. And diet is the single biggest um, cause of, of NCDs. Non-communicable diseases, again, per the uh, WHO in the last number of years, are preventable through effective interventions that tackle shared risk factors, so 101 public health, namely um, tobacco and alcohol, physical inactivity, and unhealthy diets. And diet is what I'm here to talk about today. A somewhat busy slide, but makes the point. So this uh, a very well done study, recent, uh, done over a number of years and recent global burden of disease, uh, looked at the uh, dietary risks in 195 countries, pretty much the whole UN, published in Lancet, obviously a, 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 a tier A journal. Uh, poor diet causes more deaths than any other risk factor. You look at the top 10 risk factors for death globally in 2017, so highly, highly recent. So the, um, um, the, um, the x-axis here are, um, are deaths per million per year. And you can see um, you know, it goes from zero to two to four to up to 10 million. And so uh, this per, uh, per year. Um, uh, dietary risk factors are the highest. High blood pressure is second. We, we all know the um, uh, impact of, of high blood pressure and, and, and that is a, a, a treatable, um, a major uh, uh, avoidance or treatable cause of premature um, morbidity and mortality. And high blood pressure obviously is not um, unrelated to, to diet. And, um, and a whole food plant-based diet in general is, is low and soft as well. Tobacco is number three. Um, high blood sugar, which has a number of ideologies, of course, but diet is huge, huge, huge. Air pollution next. And again, this is global. So it, it, it's speaking um, not only to, a, you know, I mean, our country has done a, um, for, for a traditional 
kind of 1940s, 50s, 60s air pollution, not um, CO2. Uh, we've had major progress, but rapidly developing countries, of course, have lots of morbidity and mortality from air pollution, but much less than the causes above. And there's still some here. Um, high BMI, and of course, that's uh, primarily diet related as well. High LDL. Um, interestingly, um, um, eight out of 10, only eight out of 10 is malnutrition, you know, undernutrition in general, which um, when, you, when you think about um, the set of the set of, of, of bar graphs here. If we were looking at at a similar result a couple of generations ago, malnutrition would be way at the top, because this is a global study. And and uh, remember the 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 sort of Western quote unquote dietary factors um, would be lower down on a global basis. But as the world has become um, wealthier, there are fewer people. Fortunately, thank goodness that uh, and there still is a, a good amount of of course food insecurity and people that suffer from um, caloric um, insufficiency and poor diet, poor intake. Um, uh, but relatively today across the globe, that's much less than the, um, uh, the harms of Western diet that we've been speaking about the last half hour or so. Um, alcohol, of course, and uh, interestingly, it's on the top 10 hit list, but not towards the top, and impaired kidney function as number 10. Healthy eating saves lives. Like I haven't been uh, talking about that today so far, right? And this um, this comes uh, again from another um, you know non-activist kind of NGO, which is what I prefer to show. I think in some ways, there's more um, credibility here. The Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, it's pretty uh, um, fifty-yard line um, kind of um, NGO in terms of um, having biases around uh, um, disease issues. Um, Healthier diets could save one in five lives every year. You'll see different numbers. One of the other slides talked about 40%. One said four out of five. Here we're saying one out of five. Um, it depends how you frame this and look at it, but it's, it's huge regardless. And so here's some of the basics. Uh, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds. The probably also should be on this slide. Uh, legumes, again, beans, um, peas, and lentils. Um, and the key point of this slide, aside from um, emphasizing what we all know, but don't always uh, follow and suggest to our patients, uh, uh, is, the, is the health benefits of fruits, vegetables, legumes, uh, whole grains, and nuts and seeds, that the change described here is not, um, you know, having a three pound uh, um, kale and, and, and uh, uh, spinach salad with um, a bunch of lentils thrown in, you know, three times a day. It's, it's fairly modest incremental change. So the, um, the change in fruit consumption, for example, top left, that's advocated is 94 grams a day, um, equivalent to one small apple. The change in whole grains going across the top, um, 29 grams per day, equivalent to less than one slice per day. Um, and uh, um, so, so that would be the sort of intake for serving and the recommended intake again for fruits would be um, two to three small apples per day, not only apples, but the equivalent of apples, fruits in general. And um, the equivalent on the whole grain side, again, not just um, slices of healthy bread, but as an equivalent metric, three to five a day, and not huge. Um, nuts and seeds, uh, you know, because they are very caloric dense, high in quote unquote good fats, um, the equivalent, and you know, walnuts are way on the, uh, uh, way on the top of especially healthy nuts, not the only one, but way on the top. Uh, uh, equivalent of eight to 13 walnut halves per day. So you know, just a handful. Um, vegetables, um, you know, one, um, one actual intake would be three small to medium carrots. And so um, um, two or three servings of that sort per day would be more than enough. So again, incremental change, relatively small servings, not impossible to do. All right, so here's the, Here's the hit list on inflammation, uh, inflammatory aging. Uh, and so I'll just take this from 12 o'clock, um, Alzheimer's disease, of course. The diet has, as we all know, and, and, I, and I know I, some of these um, may be stating the obvious, but it felt to me important to just put, put out this number of diseases and, and, and we'll say a few more words in a bit about um, healthy diets having a a substance of a major anti-inflammatory effect and unhealthy diets having a major inflammatory effect. 
Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's for sure, heart disease, which is still the, the biggest killer, um, and atherosclerosis uh, listed separately, but you know, really part of heart disease. Age-related uh, MAC degeneration, MS. Um, at six o'clock on this schematic, we'll increase the M&M &M in general. Um, ALS, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, um, osteoporosis as well, type two, and a, a number of cancers. Uh, as alluded to earlier, probably, it's not only GI cancers, but GI cancers, of course, are, are high on this list. Um, if, 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 most everyone, if most everyone ate a, a whole food plant-based, predominant, not exclusive, but predominant diet, we'd probably see a reduction in cancer in the country of at least 40%. Um, okay, here's a nice summary from, uh, from HMS. Uh, and, and they have a, a good nutrition section and, uh, and a section that pays attention to, um, to diet, to hopefully plant-based nutrition. Um, so again, 101 stuff, foods to, to reduce as much as possible that cause more inflammation, refined carbs, uh, highly processed bread and pastries, French fries, well, everybody knows that, um, soda, other sweetened beverages, red meats, processed meats, grilled meats are real bad for cancer. Uh, red meats are especially bad, and, and margarine shortening, lard, um, animal fat, um, and, and also um, margarine too. Um, Anti-inflammatory foods. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's all about fruits, vegetables, legumes, uh, nuts and seeds, um, and whole grains. And just some examples, tomatoes, olive oil. And olive oil is a, uh, as are other oils like canola, olive oil particularly is a healthy, um, a healthy oil. Since it is high in calories, one wants to be fairly uh, careful about how much olive oil one uses in cooking, but, but some olive oil is a good thing, not a bad thing. Green leafy vegetables, spinach, kale, collards, nuts, um, almonds, walnuts, I've mentioned them before, um, 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 small amounts of fatty fish, and then fruits, especially, especially berries and blueberries are, as we say in Massachusetts, I'm in Boston, wicked, wicked healthy. Uh, sorry, uh, but many fruits are, are, are good for us as we, as we all know. So this is a, a whole lecture unto itself. And let me just identify when one looks at whole food plant-based nutrition versus animal product heavy diets, there's huge, huge differences. And, and, and while these are not randomized controlled trials in general, the, the, the numbers are overwhelming. And, and the, the causality you know, is, is of a similar sort to when we looked at uh, cigarettes on a population basis in the 50s and 60s. Cholesterol, lipid uh, metabolism, TMAO, and their high association with uh, cardiovascular events. Let me say a few words about telomeres, epigenetics, and the microbiome and whole food plant-based diets. Um, and and you know, I'm not a uh, geneticist, just sort of an overview. Um, telomeres uh, are the, the caps, the ends of our chromosomes, and um, there's a strong association with whole food plant-based nutrition versus an animal um, product heavy diet in, in, in lengthening the time of chromosomal shortening uh, and, and protecting the chromosomes, which have dramatic impact on, on aging and all the diseases of aging. Um, epigenetics is uh, a field of study you may uh, be well aware of, which goes beyond the, the base pairs, not the, 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 the four uh, base pairs like adenosine and guanine, but about how the genetic code is expressed. Um, and, and so uh, genes, as we all know, are turned on and off. Um, different genes have different impact based on set and setting. And, and whole food plant-based diets have a uh, quite a substantive impact on epigenetics, on the expression of genes, and really um, revving up good genes and revving down bad genes, uh, more or less. The microbiome, the, um, our gut bacteria, we um, may know this as well, but it's, it's, it's becoming clear that it's increasingly important that whole food plant-based diets um, have a, a dramatic um, effect upon um, good, good, um, healthy um, gut bacteria and uh, uh, animal-heavy nutrition uh, for humans, um, uh, not contrary. Whole food plant-based heavy diets can reverse disease. Um, 
as well. So there's no question, no question at all that in terms of health and wellness, um, a whole food, a plant-based heavy diet or predominant diet um, enhances uh, health wellness um, and, and uh, um, uh, disease, uh, but, but also, uh, also has an impact as you would expect. And we've talked about a lot on disease prevention. Beyond that, can reverse some diseases in whole or in part. Lots of studies showing the, uh, the impact of the uh, 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 low cholesterol, um, low saturated fat, ideally taking animal products out of the diet, um, um, a good, good balanced uh, whole food plant-based predominant diet on cardiovascular disease in folks that have had, already had an event, heart attacks or otherwise. Same on type two, and there's a bunch of research um, showing that folks that switch their diets in a major way can see a significant reduction in medications. Uh, if they're on insulin, um, see insulin be reduced or go away. And some significant percentage of people with type two, when they switch diets are entirely off medications. So, hypertension, of course, and, and, and when one gets past the, um, the common diseases, just making note of the fact that for RA, um, there's evidence there as well, uh, significant evidence, well done study, that uh, a whole food plant-based diet um, can reverse um, rheumatoid arthritis. A very recent study published just a couple of months ago, um, there's lots of talk about plant-based meats. Uh, and so, um, so this is not about, let, let me first, just, this is about um, Tofurky, Impossible Burger, um, um, Beyond Meats, the, 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 the you know, tofurkey has been around a long, long time, and uh, some of the other um, uh, plant-based meat substitutes and Impossible and Beyond are newer additions to the supermarket and have been produced in a way to both texturally and taste-wise to resemble, uh, quote unquote, real meat much more. So they're pretty high in saturated fats. And so the, uh, some of the older um, meat substitutes are, are, are lower in saturated fat than, than real meat, than, than, than meat. And uh, not surprisingly, um, are, are, are likely uh, healthier than meat. Still, um, you know, a whole food plant-based diet is uh, dominant as best. But the question comes up, it's, a, it's an important uh, question on a population basis. These, these newer meats, sorry, these newer meat substitutes, uh, impossible and beyond being the ones that are that have the largest market share and have really rolled out. I've had IPOs, lots of, lots of money behind them. Um, are, they, are they any healthier? They're certainly better for the animals because you don't have to kill an animal to uh, uh, produce these. And they're better for the environment, um, um, less, less CO2 production. But we're doctors, we had to talk about health. And the question is, um, what is their impact on, on health? Uh, so a case control study, again, done recently, I've done the, been out of Stanford. Eight weeks of plant-based meats impossible, um, and uh, sorry, it was uh, it was not impossible. It was beyond beyond, the, uh, beyond meats, and eight weeks of regular meat, hamburgers, hot dogs, steaks, chicken, all the rest. Um, so each each patient or each uh, person in the study was their own control. Eight weeks on the um, uh, meat substitute, eight weeks of regular meat, and decreases were found. Um, uh, during the eight weeks of plant-based meats, quote unquote, in TMAO and LDL and weight. Um, what was uh, significant decreases, uh, this is only over eight weeks, but there, there were really a meaningful decreases and changes in weight, for example, it was about an average of a two pound uh, uh, for this population, two pound uh, difference in weight, which on a population basis over eight weeks is, uh, is quite meaningful. Interestingly, and, and not predicted in the study, the group that was randomized to uh, plant-based meat kept much of the reduction in TMAO when they switched to regular meat. So, so that the, the, uh, the hypothesis um, was that, the, again, each group was its own control, um, that for all of these markers of, these biochemical markers of bad health, like TMAO and, and LDL, um, that it wouldn't matter um, if one had a, a plant-based meat diet for eight weeks and then real meat for eight weeks or vice versa. But what happened with the groups that, um, these people had not eaten a plant-based meat in the past, or at least not in any major way, um, that uh, the folks that started on plant-based meat, that they had better TM they had lower, they had better TMAOs during the eight weeks when they were on regular meat compared to the other group. And so the uh, researchers hypothesized, and no one's really sure, hypothesized that um, there, there may have been a, 
a persistent or residual at least effect on the microbiome. Uh, it is worth noting here that while this study it was a high-end well-known study uh, in my view, uh, it's in part funded by NIH, uh, also was in part funded by Beyond Meat, um, and, and uh, you know, well, not quite like a pharma study, but still, from the paper's conflict statement, uh, quote unquote, to reduce any influences on the study, analysis was conducted by a third party individual who had no involvement with the design, uh, with the study design, uh, uh, nor the collection of data, and was blinded to all participants. I did want to um, describe that. Okay, role of the clinician. Um, and I know that we're emergency physicians, and this is a, a different uh, uh, doctor patient relationship than, say, in primary care or cardiology. There's a, there's a well done program in a number of studies. Uh, first of all, the CHIP, the Complete Health Improvement Program. This is a, uh, some of these, uh, this, is, this is a way to get people to uh, be healthier, change their diets, and, and, and has other lifestyle uh, medicine interactions, stress reduction, sleep, um, all the rest. And this is diet heavy. So it, it shows the science. This is for lay people and it is all about behavior change. Um, and, and so um, usually given, and, and now entirely given the, you know, virtually, um, it's two, uh, uh, two webinars a week over eight weeks and uh, well shown to, uh, um, to create uh, change that, uh, that, that lasts. Um, uh, also wanted to, to make note of the fact that and not a, uh, a diet study, but a, a smoking cessation study uh, with a, a high-end uh, Cochrane Review uh, evaluation that, that physicians who um, counsel their patients um, about the smoking cessation, um, that, that two minutes, two minutes can have a real impact. And what was uh, interesting, and I would argue reassuring as I'm talking to um, emergency physician colleagues, that, that at least in that study with smoking, 10 minutes was no better than two minutes. So quick hits um, can make a difference. And, and you, you all work and live. It's been a long time for me and I did it with kids and really with their, their parents uh, for the most part. Um, um, uh, not all of our work, but a chunk of our work is behavior change. And we all have our tools and you know we need to get people when they're ready to, to make change. It has to be meaningful, it has to be about their health, somebody who's having chest pain. Um, um, I know in, in, in pediatrics, um, the easiest, for example, the easiest way, far and away, the easiest person to get to stop smoking is a mom who's, uh, who's pregnant or um, has an infant or young child at home, um, especially with asthma. Um, you know, one's family is always, is always most important. Asking questions, not you need to do this thing. And, 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 and again, I, I won't spend any more time there. You're, it's been a while for me and you are, are all day in and day out, highly experienced that behavior change. And it's, uh, but, but uh, um, brief interactions can, can make a difference. Um, and I, and I, I know, um, um, and, I, and I did some general um, um, emergency medicine in my uh, younger days um, before, um, 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 in the early days of the field when uh, people like me without a residency were able to uh, work in uh, general hospital emergency departments. Um, uh, and our own role of, uh, you know, not only good health and good nutrition, is, is very, very meaningful. It's, um, it's, it's I think, without, um, again, saying this in, in the, the kindest way possible and about our role in supporting helping patients, that it's much easier to offer advice about, uh, say, about weight management when, when we um, look healthy and, you know, lean and trim and so on ourselves. Um, and, of course, it's good for us. Oops, sorry. Um, so a few um, useful organizations uh, and websites as uh, winding down. I know these slides will be available to you soon after the talk. I mentioned uh, Michael Greger and Nutrition Facts. Michael's great. We also talked about the, uh, and there's a wealth, a wealth of uh, uh, information, mostly about nutrition, also about some other lifestyle medicine um, uh, aspects on his, uh, his website. Um, he, he puts on a, uh, large variety of useful resources and his core deliverable is every day a, a three to five minute uh, um, video. Um, Blue Zones we talked about, Lighter World is a, a, a for-profit company I, uh, that, that, uh, um, that offers uh, advice and takes one through the steps, the process to move towards a whole food plant-based diet. I mentioned the Harvard folks who do good work in their nutrition um, area. 
PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, is the uh, kind of the granddaddy or uh, grandmommy of of, uh, of, of them uh, of them all. Was the I think founded. I've been a member for over thirty years. Was uh, um, you can see the gray hairs. Uh, was founded in the 80s by Neil, Neil Bernard, who remains the president and has a wealth, a wealth of information about the um, whole food plant-based uh, nutrition and uh, immune health. Eat Forms, a useful site. I mentioned Lifestyle Medicine, the Plantrition Project, um, um, founded by Scott Stoll. Dr. Stoll does wonderful work, especially, especially in the um, conference space. Um, Balance.org is a, a charity based in the States that does some work overseas as well as mostly a U.S. organization that works with schools, universities, and hospitals to affect incremental change. To, uh, they'll go in and uh, work with um, a champion and with dietary um, and leadership and get about a 20% in phase one, a 20% to move towards whole food plant-based offerings and in institutional um, um, Diet, um, and so, and I, and I would mention also as a as a bit of a, a PSA for a balance. I have great great respect for that that charity. Um, if if any of you or colleagues uh, are ever interested in uh, being a champion or know someone again who would be a champion at your own hospital, I know we all sit around and we talk about yeah the hospital cafeteria and the food that patients get served. That's crap in terms of uh, everything that we've been talking about the last forty five minutes here. And, and, and how do we affect change? And um, uh, when I talk with the founder of, of Balance, she tells me that um, you know they're they're a special sauce, and they know all the nuts and bolts, all the, um, the the detailed kinds of ways to get in to make change. They need one champion, so you know one one doctor who's reasonably well placed um, in institution is is enough frequently to um, help them get in and make a difference. Uh, and then. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out my, uh, my own charity here. Um, Physicians Association for Nutrition, our, our, our global website and our US website, which are pretty similar. So PAN, um, we've been around four years. Um, our, uh, we're we're uh, a global charity. We are based in Europe and Germany with a number of European national offices, a US presence. I work with the, the two leaders in, uh, uh, in Europe, hand in hand, day in and day out, both on the medical side and on the uh, charity program development side. Uh, we are growing our presence in uh, developing countries, Global South as well. We have, uh, um, as I said, a, a number of branches in Europe here in the States, and uh, we'll, we'll soon have a branch in South Africa. We're hoping to be in the Arabian Peninsula soon. We're hoping to be in Southeast Asia, starting with Thailand, have a very strong Israeli office. But for the States, uh, and we're here and we happy to be partners. Pan. The Physicians Association for Nutrition aims to raise awareness amongst health professionals, the public, and policymakers about the role of whole food, plant-based nutrition in promoting good health and preventing and treating disease, as, as we've talked about. We pan strive to make nutrition a key part of, uh, of MedEd, to empower health professionals by providing evidence-based educational materials, uh, effective nutrition programs and resources, building a global network of uh, Docs, dietitians, nurses, other health professionals, scientists, and students. Students are important to us. Um, we have a, a substance of a major medical student program. Um, and we are creating an influential um, global medical organization to promote a policy change as well. One more Gregor quote. You can tell I, uh, I have you know, the highest respect for Michael. Quote, we should all be eating fruits and vegetables as if our lives depend on it, because they do. And I always, and it's corny, and I always end my, or typically end my, my talks with a Dilbert Q&A. That concludes my two hours, one hour, uh, my two hour presentation. Any questions? Did you intend the presentation to be incomprehensible? Or do you have some sort of rare PowerPoint disability? Any questions about the content? Sorry, there was content? Okay. <laughs> there you have it. It's been a pleasure. Um, and for me, coming back to SAEM, it's, it's been a, 25 years um, since I've been at a uh, SAEM podium. This one is uh, is virtual, and uh, I'm happy to to speak to uh, physicians that I have the greatest respect for, and I'd be delighted to uh, take any of your questions at this time. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Thank you so much, Alan. That was great. I uh, really appreciate it. We've had some active comments going on in the chat um, about uh, and some articles and links to um, papers and uh, some articles and as well as to balance.org. Um, if anyone has any specific questions they want to throw up in the chat or raise your hand, um, now would be a, a good time for that. Caitlin, did you have um, anything else you wanted to add? Yes, excellent. So I have a few thoughts. Um, so I think one of the questions that a lot of people have, myself included, is this idea of how you change human behavior. Because even, even us as physicians, we know the science, but actually, you know, something like nutrition labels, like we know that's readily available, but why it, haven't we cured obesity? So like the actual act of changing behavior is one of the questions, not only for us, but for our patients too. And so um, can you talk to any of the science about that or any uh, wisdom you have <laughs> in helping us? Because I think that's one of the things that aligns nicely with climate change as well. No, no, absolutely. So, so I, um, um, you know, I've read some of the science and this, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of science and some lives in the medical literature and there's of course lots of, the science and the social science literature. And uh, I'm not sure that I would uh, dignify my opinions or my experiences by the word wisdom, but I'll do my, my best. I, I would start by saying that, um, that probably the, amongst the most important things is to, we're physicians, is to, is to both be caring and be authentic. And I know everybody knows that. So, so that um, when, when we're in front, of, um, you know, in, front of our own, in front of the laptop and we're doing EMR, and we're going through a checklist, and there's more than a primary care than emergency medicine, but there's some in this practice as well. And we're going through a checklist. You know, people people know that. Yeah, we're doing our job, but it doesn't grab grab patients. Um, so, so a um, if, if one has both on this subject, and then and I know you all do um, have genuine care for for your patients for patients. Uh, it's it starts with. Um, with, with care and compassion um, and authenticity. And then again, I, I know you all know this and I, I've, I've, I've been very worried about sounding patronizing given the work you do and that I, I no longer, I stopped seeing patients five years ago, um, um, that, um, that when we're offering behavioral change advice, that at least in that moment, nothing else needs to be going on from the patient's point of view than our communication to the patient. We have to appear entirely focused on the patient. So those are, those are you know, quote unquote words of wisdom, which are basic in medicine and wicked hard to do, um, maybe especially in this practice. Um, I would add that frequently um, um, raising issues um, in the form of a question tends to be much less off-putting um, that allows the, the patient or, or ourselves to, or, or a friend's family um, to, to think about it ourselves. It, it, it never, ever, ever works to say, you know, you should do this thing. You know, we, we, everybody has an immediate negative response. Um, I, I, I think, um, you know, where possible anchoring on family can be very useful. That's more immediate. Um, and, and diet is a really good place for that because um, most, most of us eat um, with people in our families. And, and if we're making a change in our diet and that helps our, our, our partners, um, our children, um, that, can be, that can be huge as well. Um, so those would be uh, some things that, that, that come to mind. There's, there, there also is, uh, you know, whether, whether it's, it's, it's physician counseling, and this is hard emergency medicine, physician counseling, or it's one-on-one -on -one marketing stuff, right? You know, you need to, it needs to be done more than once. So it needs to be part of a system or a schema. People need to uh, to hear more than once. People have to be ready for change, want to grab somebody when they're ready, um, and, uh, and not just have it be a checklist. And so, uh, again, you know all that. None of that is really rocket science. There are some well-published studies. Um, I guess the one other thing I would add, and there's more of this in the, the social sciences literature than at least what I've seen in the, the med literature, um, it's what everybody else is doing. Um, there's a, a, my, my, my last uh, behavioral um, study to refer, this is entirely in the social science literature, or really the business literature, I think, that uh, hotels have tried for years and years and years to get people to not throw their towels on the floor every day and get new towels because it cost them a bunch of money. And so they, they've tried um, 
you know, and you'll see that when you go to a hotel, there'll be a sign, you know, encouraging, you know, you get bonus points or this or that. Um, and sometimes the, there'll be a lot of climate stuff associated with that. Some hotels have found, and there's a, a business literature, that the single biggest um, anchor point is everybody else is doing it. You know, many of our customers are doing this. Uh, we all want to be, you know, we're, we're a, a communal tribal species. So that I think bringing um, the fact that these kinds of food changes are, um, are what everybody else is doing, um, uh, or what many more people are doing. This is not, you know, crunchy granola hippie stuff from the oldie timey days. This is where we're all, uh, many of us are moving, uh, moving towards. And, and the last thing I know I said, that would be uh, uh, my, my last uh, verbal bullet. And, and I guess you got me uh, going there, Caitlin, but would be incremental change. It's the rare, there are people, it's the rare person. You know, there are people who will go from eating half a cow a day to, to, to eating entirely a vegan diet and pretty healthy and then ultimately very healthy in a month's time. Uh, but that's unusual. It's about making small changes. Um, um, meatless Mondays, um, no, you know, um, uh, no, no, uh, no, no meat or animal products before uh, 5 p.m., um, uh, things like that. Um, so th those would be some, some thoughts that come to mind. I hope that's a, a little bit helpful. Caitlin, I Caitlin, to your point though, I think it's interesting, right, that like most physicians don't smoke cigarettes, right? Like we, we all sort of set an example, like we all know the literature, we don't smoke. Most physicians don't follow a plant-based diet or even a vegetarian diet. And part of that is lack of education, right, in medical school, which is one of the goals of PAN is to sort of improve that. And part of that is we're just not taught about it. And part of it is willful ignorance, I think, on the part of a lot of people who don't want to make personal change. Um, and it's much less obvious than, say, lighting up a cigarette, right? And so we have to take personal interest in our own behavior, um, I think, in order to create change around this sort of more broadly and for our patients, right? It's easy for us to all preach don't smoke, but if we're all eating terrible food, then it, it doesn't come to the forefront of our interactions with our patients. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. I totally agree, of course, and, and uh, it, it follows Caitlin's question around behavior change and, and, and the fact that we physicians who are you know, about, about health um, don't, uh, uh, at least with respect to diet, frequently don't practice what we preach. Um, I would, um, um, so the first, um, the first medical staff meeting that I, that I went to, um, and, and again, I just, uh, just touched my, uh, my gray hairs for, uh, for a fact was 1983. And, uh, um, and, and so it was a medical staff meeting, but it was a dinner, you know, a little bit of business, mostly people schmoozing, having dinner and drinks. And, and, uh, um, Every table had an ashtray on it. And I would say that probably back when I was a young doctor, eh, 10 to 20% of the doctors in the room in 1983 were smoking. By 1990, no doctor was smoking, or at least not in, in public and not with colleagues. There were no ashtrays uh, at medical staff dinners. It changed like that. Society changed. And, and so you're right, around, um, around uh, uh, the this, this same medical staff dinners, um, um, you know, again, I, the last one I went to was uh, was five years ago, but that wasn't so long ago. The, the only progress there that you know, plant-based choice or you know, a vegan, uh, a vegan choice uh, was one of the three or four choices that didn't used to be the case. So that's progress, but still, most people were eating a, you know, a good chunk of steak and having a baked potato with uh, sour cream, uh, um, you know, glopped on top of it. So we haven't changed that much. I would argue then that it's it's really about societal change. And so in the 50s, early 60s, there's all these commercials, you know, there's commercials from the 50s, like with Ronald Reagan when he was an actor, you know, smoking a lucky uh, uh, L&M or a Marlboro, or a, I may get the brands, the brands wrong from those commercials, but there was one commercial that more doctors, I'll, I'll say Marlboro, I'm not sure that's right, that, uh, that more doctors smoke Marlboro than any other brand in the 1950s. So, so you know, our, and, and, and by the 50s, early 60s, we, we knew it wasn't good stuff. Um, and there was a huge societal change, multifactorial public interventions of various sorts, led by health. So I think we are getting not quite at a tipping point, but as a society beginning to get to a place where it's no longer a weird or strange thing to, to be eating a whole food plant-based uh, dominant, dominant diet. So that, that helps. Uh, there is all this cognitive dissonance. You know, it's the usual, you know, I'm a good person, I'm a healthy person, I eat meat, eating meat must be healthy. And, and, and so we, we do that in a cognitive dissonant sort of way. 
I, so it, it goes back to all of the, the, the comments I made just a moment ago in, in response to Caitlin's question. And it's, it's, it's about getting people where they are and it's about incremental change. And I do think that physicians now, it's gonna sound preachy, but you know, teeing off on your question, we do have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to, this is amongst the most, maybe the most important thing any of us can do for our health. And, and we need to um, speak to it and live it and show it. It's also not that hard anymore. Um, I've been veg for over 30 years and, and uh, fully plant-based for 18 years now. And it's, um, you know, each, each change took some energy in my part. And after a few months, I got pretty good at it. And after six, 12 months, I'm real good at it. Um, but it's easier now. There's so many products and the, you know, one doesn't have to, again, have to eat a spale and uh, spale, a uh, spinach and, uh, and kale salad at lunch every day. There's, there's all these choices that are, um, um, you know, quasi processed, not fully processed, pretty healthy uh, that people can start with. And, and, um, and then of course there's looking at, uh, looking at labels. So we need to model it. Uh, I don't know that I really um, gave any, any um, um, brilliant um, opening there, but, but uh, uh, hopefully that was a, at least responsive to some extent to your question. Thanks, Tracy. Academic conferences are also a huge source um, and opportunity for us to change some of these behaviors um, in regards to carbon footprint, but also education and uh, food availability at these. Um, I know we've been working with SAEM to try and get them um, to switch to plant-based diet. So we'll see, but um, <laughs> that's another good opportunity for students within your own institutions. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's huge. And uh, hopefully by next year, we'll get back to a uh, society where we, 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 we meet with colleagues in, a, in person again, beyond our own uh, institutions. But I agree with you. And uh, I have been at a, a number of, of conferences where the, uh, the meal is, is plant-based at, at big hotels. And it's, um, um, it's doable. It's, uh, some chefs really get into it. It's um, at, at minimum, it's, um, um, it's about offering choices. It's about the food being highly appetizing. Uh, so, um, so I would, um, you know, make sure that that's the, uh, that's the case. And, 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 you know, one other, um, advice that I sometimes give also to, to and again, balance.org is a great organization to help with institutional change. Um, one other, um, um, a uh, piece of advice that, that I've been giving the last few years would be when, when somebody is changing a, you know, a huge buffet um, um, from entirely um, uh, meat to a number of healthy plant-based alternatives, don't have the, um, the plant-based food be, if you'll pardon the, the word, be in the ghetto, be sort of out over there, you know, uh, hidden away. And yeah, if you want to get, you know, get your spinach salad, it's over there. It needs to be front and center. And, and, and ideally, well, ideally, we all move to you know, fully whole food plant-based, but uh, short of ideally, we're in a place with institutions uh, like the meetings you're talking about. Um, and I would, would hope to be at the SAAM's uh, Atlanta meeting next year if it actually happens. We get to a place where the plant-based choices are the default mode and the, the, um, um, the, the less healthy meat choices are a little bit off to the side. That would be huge change. It's all incremental. So that's, that's how I see it. I did post a link. Hi, this is Ross. <laughs> oh, to get come unmuted. on. So yeah. I work in a safety net hospital. More than half of my patients speak Spanish, and the other half are probably more concerned with just feeding their families than what they're feeding yeah. their yeah. families. Do you have any resources you would suggest for this, you know, either lower health literacy or even just lower English literacy, non-English reading population? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of, um, let, let me send you, I, I, I don't, there, there's a couple of um, websites and NGOs that do good work there. And, and I, um, um, I, can, I can send that, you know, right, right after the talk, but I just, I'm not going to say it right now. So, because it's, it's really, it's really critical, like you say, it's absolutely critical. And I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that. I've, I've been, in terms of my work, I've been learning, to, uh, we're growing pan branches in developing countries. And so that's a, a different sort of spin or take on that in the, in the states. It's it's huge, um, so, but I I have some resources. I will send that. Uh, should I send that to Tracy and Caitlin? Is that what I should, should do after the talk? So. Sure. Yeah, we can get that out to everyone. Yeah. Sorry, I don't, and next time I do this, I'll I'll have that as, as one of my uh, uh, one of my useful um, 
uh, organizations that I'll add that to the, uh, the slide next time too. So thank you, Ross, I appreciate it. I posted a link in the chat as well about EPIC and reducing emergency department visits by addressing social determinants of health. And so every health system is a little bit different, but I know EPIC is one health system, electronic health records, um, almost 50% now I think of hospitals in the US have EPIC, uh, but they've been focusing on uh, social determinants of health uh, as one thing. And I just saw working clinically the other day, they have a whole dashboard now that has all 12 uh, social determinants of health on it um, and components. And so I think that nutrition is just one aspect of that and that can be incorporated. Uh, and as we learn more and as we learn how to implement it effectively within our own healthcare systems and emergency departments, we'll be able to address patients' concerns better. Um, both here and, and from a global health standpoint. Um, yeah. I would add to, to your comments and, and to Ross's, uh, you know, especially there's been, I would say some, some progress in the last several years, but a long way to go that all of us that, and you can tell I didn't have a resource as one of the resources to, to list, um, um, so, so that we don't have a, um, you know, a bunch of upper middle class people, physicians and otherwise who are, who are speaking to, uh, you know, kale and spinach and, uh, and not speaking to what it's like to be in a, a community where um, people are impoverished and English isn't their first language and, and so on. There's, there's been um, uh, some progress there and, and, and also more food choices. It's, it's, it's also from a public policy point of view to go a little beyond, maybe beyond your question, the meat is, um, meat is so cheap in America, at least some kind of meat because it's so heavily subsidized. Um, and, and so that's, you know, it's cheap to take your family to McDonald's. And so that's, uh, it's also not expensive to eat a healthy uh, plant-based diet. It takes a little more work, a little less hard than it used to be, but still some more work um, in some communities. So anyhow, I will pass on some resources and I will make a point. Next time I do a talk like this to, uh, uh, to speak more to that. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. We are at the top of the hour. Um, you are free to leave. Uh, Dr. Kornberg, it has been an absolute pleasure and we thank you again for your time and talents and sharing uh, your wisdom with us. Um, is it okay if we share your slides um, with the participants moving forward or at least the resources? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so the, uh, uh, the society is, is, is going to put it up on its, its website. Um, I think that happens in the next uh, few days. Also, um, uh, to uh, SAM uh, staff and to uh, Caitlin and Tracy, feel feel free, feel encouraged. That anyone who wants um, um, my slides, um, just send them along. And if anybody wants to email me uh, directly for the slides or for any further conversation on this, uh, please do. And I, I should have had my ending slide have my email address as well. But it's a uh, it's a period Kornberg K O R N. V E R G at pan, P A N dash U S A dot org. So the short answer is yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Kornberg, and thank you, Caitlin, for getting all this. Seminar is, uh, what's the date of it? Is it October? October 1st. October 1st. All right. Well, hopefully, we'll see you all back October 1st for the next lecture.